Uh, thank you for joining our uh, second day of the Applied Bioinformatics in Agriculture and Medicine seminar. I'm really glad that uh, you have joined us for the second day and I hope that uh, yesterday's seminar was really informative with all the excellent speakers giving a really nice uh, introduction to bioinformatics in and its application in animal science, agriculture, as well as medicine. And today uh, our talks are gonna be a little bit more technical and we're going to enter, uh, we're going to give you a um, much more detailed information about how uh, bioinformatics actually work in a real life scenario. And I'd like to introduce the moderator for today, uh, today's seminar, who will be uh, Dr. Radhika Bartola. So Dr. Bartola, the floor is yours now. Uh, thank you, Dr. Podil. Good morning, good evening, and namaste. Um, I would like to welcome again to the second day of our session. Seeing the overwhelming number of participants yesterday, more than 300 unique hits on Zoom, more than 3,000 view on Facebook live and um, afterward, and so many sharings in Twitter, we are so excited to begin our session today. Without any further ado, um, I would like to invite Mr. Cecil Podel and Dr. Ananta Acharya to um, begin the talk. They will be giving a talk on um, coronavirus genome and evolution. Um, so welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Bartola. Okay, can you please, can you see our screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, again, thank you. Thank you everyone uh, for joining us today. Hopefully, uh, we, 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 you had some introduction about the bioinformatics and genomics yesterday. And today we are going to talk about a little bit more detail on coronavirus and also about rice. So, um, in the first talk today, we are going to talk about the evolution, the genome of coronavirus and the evolution of this one. So the first one is how, so just, just as, as, as a disclaimer, I'm not a biologist. Uh, I'm just a bioinformatician or a genomic scientist. So the most of the information here are based on our understanding uh, from the perspective of a bioinformatician and, and different literatures. Uh, if we, if, if we look at the uh, coronavirus has different names, right? So coronavirus, uh, that is a common name. We call it COVID-19. Uh, I think it's the disease is called generally the COVID-19. And with the uh, SARS-CoV-2 is what is called the real strain, the, the strain of that virus. If you look at the virus, it has different com structural components. If you look at this, bluish green color on the outside these are called the spikes and that is what the is that is what made up of that spike protein if you look at this uh, uh, pink color uh, that is called envelope if you look at this purple uh, blue color that is called membrane or m and if you look at this blue inside this inside uh, here attached to the uh, attached to the RNA, those are the nucleoplasmids, and that string, that blue string, is the RNA, and this is a single-stranded RNA virus, and the length of the RNA is about 30, 30 uh, kilobases. Uh, the property of this spike protein, uh, it, it binds to the binds to the human cell membrane, and that's what how it attacks human. So if you look at very closely, the virus, uh, the spike protein is uh, attached with the cellular receptor and then it enters the cytoplasm and then it, then it starts that genomic function there. So from that, from, from this nuclear, uh, from this RNA here, it starts the RNA application, it makes the protein, those different proteins I talked about, the spike, spike protein envelope, uh, membrane, nucleo, nucleoplasmids, and nucleocapsids, sorry, nucleocapsids. And then the RNA itself is replicated. Then all these proteins and this RNA are assembled, and then that makes the virus. And now the cell goes through the lysis and then 
it will release more and more of those uh, virus. And that's how the virus uh, cont multiplies in the cell. So it creates, it, it, it uh, generates all those different proteins, but how, wh where those proteins are encoded are actually in that RNA, single standard RNA. And if you look at that single standard RNA, it has uh, about 200 base pairs of untranslated region and about 200 base pairs of uh, three prime untranslated region. And then about this long, about 20,000 base pairs of open reading frame, which will have all non-structural proteins, some, some proteins that, that, that will define when to inst start the translation or transcription and other triggers. This will also have that S protein, the spike protein, the EE protein, envelope protein, M, uh, as in membrane or somebody, some calls it matrix, and also the nucleo, uh, nucleocosmin. So all these different proteins, this is the structure of the uh, SARS-CoV-2. And you know the SARS-CoV-2, we are calling it a SARS-CoV-2 because we know some years earlier we had a SARS virus and we, we, we generally talk about, okay, what about other coronavirus or what about the bat virus and those kind of things. So when we, before we go back, go to that evolution, I want to briefly introduce what actually is PCR and how do we detect whether we have virus in human. So if you look at that, that RNA assembly again, we have different S proteins or OR, ORFs or N and different reasons. So we design a primer so that it can amplify or if it was in the, in the, in the genome itself, it would be called replication. But because we'll be doing the PCR, we'll just amplify some segments of the viral DNA. So when we attach those primers, if there are virus, we are going to see some amplification. If there are no virus, we are not going to see those amplifications. And based on what assay we are using, based on it is a CDC, WHO, and a lot in, in Japan and Korea, India, all, they actually use a lot of different assay. Different companies use different assay, and these are some of them. And based on that, it has the it has the primer, it has the probe which will uh, generate the fluorescence. And based on the level of fluorescence, you can actually see whether it is negative, no fluorescence, or it, ha it is positive based on the fluorescence, you can actually also tell if you had a control of the human RNA, you can actually tell the viral load uh, if it has, maybe they just started or it has multiplied a lot times 200 or 2000 and so on. So that's how that PCR testing works. So now going back to the evolution uh, and, and how we, we know there were other side, uh, SARS, other SARS or uh, bat virus, very related coronavirus, how it works. We have to remember what the mutation is. A mutation is just some error on replicating that DNA. So when that, when we are making, uh, uh, when the virus is replicating and when it has to make a T in instead, it makes C or G or something else, then that is a point mutation but all mutations are not equal so let's say there is an amino acid uh, there is a there is a codon ttc which codes for the lysine amino acid and if there is no mutation it's going to produce lysine let's say the last letter t c changes to the t then still in the codon level it is not going to change anything it is still lysine but if the first base is changed then it is going to become a stop colon and if you change the middle letters t to c it is going to be arginine and if that t becomes g that is big uh, that is uh, becoming thr is uh, theonine or something i sorry i forgot that but uh, another message out of those 20 base 20 messages so depends on what was the original uh, uh, nucleotide and what it is changed to and which frame it is on, then it depends whether that mutation is actually making some effective change or not. So if we look at the, again, that 29,903 uh, base pairs, about 30 kilo base, base pairs, and if we just look at this spike protein, uh, in the in, in spike protein, 
And if you focus on the S1 subunit, you are going to see some chain of these all different amino acids and different roles here are whether they are bat or human or this new SARS-CoV-2 or the old SARS-CoV. If, if you look at that one, you see some change here in the amino acid where it was probably originally Y, it became L or there was nothing earlier, but it became E or D or different changes and that changes is actually making that spike protein more acceptable by that S2 receptor binding domain and that is that may be the reason why this is attacking more human and also if you look at the other regions of the same uh, same S protein you will see some changes like here if you see here there were uh, some insertion of three or four amino acids amino acids that is about 12 base pairs in that region now it makes it changes the property of that spike protein and which is making it uh, more effective on attacking human so looking at this one what we can say is it looks like it was being evolved from one mutation to another mutation to another mutation so if you look at that closely on a on a on a, a tree level you can see how this evolution started and you, you will see a lot of this all this SARS-CoV-2 on this clade here and all this SARS-CoV-1 COV original one in this clade here and with other related uh, SARS-like coronaviruses related here. So on the theories on this so how, how this one originated sometimes we hear about uh, some conspiracy theories it was probably synthetic man-made and those kind of things we we cannot say for sure what happened but looking at the uh, sequences genetic sequences and understanding the genomic evolution what we think is or what we know is that it was probably the product of some mutation and there were some nat natural selection in the animal host for example bat before it transferred to human or it was actually came to human first and then started some natural selection within human so these are these two competing theories on what might have actually happened uh, on how this uh, covid 19 came so that is on the evolution of how we came up to this uh, sars cov2 and then uh, Sisir uh, is going to uh, talk about what after that, what after that November uh, post, post incidence of uh, SARS-CoV-2 on November, what is happening? What are the different evolutions and mutations after that? So uh, floor is yours, Sisir. Okay. Do you want to share your screen or do you want to drive me? Uh, I'm sharing my screen. Okay. Is it up? Yes. Okay. So for the clade assignment that we want to look at different clades and how these viruses are evolving. Uh, so we are using Nextrain uh, tool and there are really, really other tools available. One is another approach is using GIS AID and this is a tool where a lot of sequences are deposited. It's acting like right now a central database. And for the one we are using right now, Nextrain, this is an open source project uh, which are maintained by a lot of collaborators working in biology and genomics and evolution, and they keep track of uh, pathogen evolution. So with this next train, uh, how they assign this clade de uh, depends on the rule, and the rule are a new clade is assigned when its frequency is higher than 20% globally, and the new clade uh, should be at least two mutations away from its parent clade, and clade name consists of the year, like 2019, and the next available letter in the alphabet. So if you look at this uh, clade assignment, 
can see here during the first initial outbreak, 2019, November, December, there were two different clades, uh, difference by two mutations, which I'll talk in next slide. So this, this, this one was the first appearance. And then in early January, there's another clade uh, in 2020. So that's 20A. And in mid-January, 20B. Uh, and then in uh, February, 20C. So if we look at the mutations, uh, in first, this is the Wuhan reference, 19A clade. And this is, it evolves into second clade, 19B. And because of two uh, mutation difference at these positions, and this clade is prevalent in Asia during the first month of the outbreak. And once this 19A is the one that is predominant during this time, and uh, there are new three mutations. Those are dominated in largely in European outbreaks. These three mutation leads to new clade of 20A in early January here. And uh, after that, there, there appears three new mutations, another European clade at 20B on uh, mid-January. And then finally, you have two more mutation from ancestor of 20A, with, uh, with, which uh, is assigned as 20C mutations. And these are largely North American clades. So we have, so far we have five clades, two in 2019 and three in uh, 2020. And as I mentioned earlier, so if there is new clade that comes, uh, that passes this threshold, then it will be marked as 20D, uh, depending on the mutations and how uh, it gets assigned. So if you look at these mutations, uh, over here, you see that the, these, at least three ones are synonymous mutations, which are the, like earlier it was mentioned that all mutations are, mutations are not equal. So they, these mutations do not change pro, protein amino acid sequence, but there are other ones, they do change. And the most interesting one and relevant one here is the spike protein. And once people saw that uh, they, there was this clade in 23403 mutation A to Z, then everybody was really interested on this one. And they wanted to further study uh, what this mutation is and how it affects uh, coronavirus evolution and genomics. So if we look at S protein that we have been discussing, so S protein, S gene is codes this spike proteins, which, uh, which uh, binds with intercellular inter, uh, plasma membrane receptors and get endocytosis and then starts its process uh, of uh, capturing host uh, machinery. So if this mutation of D61G, which I'll be calling a D mutation, the original one, and G mutation is the one that is mutated one. So it lies in, you have sub S1 subunits and S2 subunits. So it lies in S1 subunit towards the end of uh, this, at this location. And if you look at the structure, so you have, S1 new subunit here, S2 subunit here, and this is the interface where S1 and sub two, so S2 unit uh, interacts. So D is located on the surface of spike protein, and it forms hydrogen bond with T859, uh, which is from S1 unit towards the end, you have D614, and there is another uh, amino acid, T859, it forms hydrogen bond, at this interface. And this holds uh, S1 and S2 subunit together. Like you have S1, you have this D6, D mutation, D here, and then T from S2 subunit, and it holds this complex together and is important in intercellular uh, binding the receptor. So once this D is mutated to G, it loses uh, this hydrogen bond and increases flexibility and alters glycosylation so if we need to zoom from another picture, so there is glycosylation complex here. So it gets usually this, if you have glycosylation, then those epitopes are not presented. And once it gets exposed, then you have more binding and interactions, right? So the idea is, uh, hypothesis is that maybe uh, this is somehow playing a role. And also because of this bone loss, this becomes more flexibility. So you, you, you kind of, hypothesize different ideas about what may be going on here. So then earlier when they started to look at the structures and mutations, then people uh, in different research groups started publishing the impact of this mutation. And they started uh, showing this data that uh, 
gene mutation is, uh, was, which was prevalent earlier is start, starting to slow down and it is getting dominated by D mutation. Uh, D mutation is dominated by G mutation here. So G mutation from 0% here and then uh, so G, G ones, so D1 is getting to G1. So I'm getting confused with D and G. So, uh, so especially last two weeks ago in sometime in July, so they, they, there was a paper from Cell which got really uh, nail and coffin that uh, about this mutation. Uh, and they showed that the, the D614G mutation increases infectivity of the COVID viruses. And it was also covered really well in the uh, news as well. So what they showed was that during early uh, end of February, demutation was really uh, dominant. But at the start to go you towards March or so, then you have uh, dominance of uh, G mutation here. So by the time you compare before and after March 1, you can see that it was G mutation here and then G starts to appear in uh, Europe. And then by the end of March and now you have G mutation that's everywhere in the world that is the dominant, right? So, and this study, this paper further studied the impact of this uh, G mutation. And what they found out that the viral load, if you have G mutation, then it's much higher than D mutation. So basically if, you, uh, if the patient comes and they have a G strain or in their in infection, and you do RT-PCR and you have, like we mentioned that, to, you have a certain threshold for detection. Like we say that to call that patient at COVID positive, you need to have some cycles and um, less cycle, meaning uh, you are detecting there are more viral load in your system and you are detecting it earlier, right? So this one, if you have G mutation, you are getting detected way earlier because the viral load is higher versus D mutation, uh, which requires more number of cycles. So uh is what 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 is the impact of this uh, mutation is it the infection is more severe because oftentimes and you may be more in, infected but what is the pathogenicity right so but the study right now is that the spiral road and disease severity, severity are not correlated they have not been able to establish this connection between you have more viral road and you know, the patients are doing is there statistically not significantly different. So a hospital, hospitalization rate or ICU rate or how people are uh, mortality rate, there are not much difference uh, between these two strains. And these studies are ongoing. And so far there are uh, three research that we could find is, the first one is the one the about thousand patients, which describes this uh, was published in cell. And then there are other independent studies, which were also not able to verify that you know, having G mutation in this position uh, will also have more disease severity. And so we wanted to also look at uh, the mutation, if this mutation is present in Nepal, and we use the tool uh, from uh, next train. And we can, so unfortunately, we only had one sequence sometime in early January. And in this, this one did not have G mutation. It was the original one, D mutation. So the next we could we were interested to see what's going on in India, and they do have a lot of G mutation, which also correlates in the global population. So, so that is the one D614 G mutation where studies have been done in extensively, and it's ongoing. And this one is, uh, like you can see, it's pretty much dominant right now. And there are a few other uh, mutations in spike protein, L, this L5 position, but these are not you know, in higher uh, frequency as in uh, as this G1 is. So this is the uh, place where uh, we can see that the spike protein has very few mutations overall, and this is still keep on going. And Dr. Acharya is going to continue uh, discussing about what's next. Uh, you can you can continue driving the slide, and I can. Uh... Uh, I only have these ones. Oh, okay, okay. I'll I'll, I'll share my. Time.
okay so so what's next we, we are seeing all these mutations right so uh, what's next what what will happen next is obviously all of us interested on okay when will it go away or how it will go away and that is something we are interested in so uh, i just want to speculate, speculate in some of the things here uh, based on some other evidences we had so how this will end it might become from pandemic to it might become endemic so for example uh, the, that D614G, we are seeing that mutation so much and it is actually making more infections. Uh, and, and as Cecil was saying, it does not have any correlation with the hospital admission or severity of the disease. But sometimes what might happen is it might still infect, but we may not have that severity. Uh, we may not have that same level of hospital admissions or it, it will be it will become like the common cold or it will become like a flu, flu with all these mutations so that is one of the very natural way to uh, you know go away and and it might take some time uh, but that is very uh, that is one possibility the other one is vaccine uh, so we we will have a lot of different kind of vaccines so uh, we had the vaccines for h1n1 uh, pandemic earlier and we all we, we we now have seven eight or nine vaccines in our childhood for different diseases and we also have the viral vaccines for a lot of other diseases so uh, for viral diseases so hopefully we'll get to the we'll get some vaccine and and if you hear if you heard Cecil's talk yesterday uh Cecil was showing more than a, a lot of more than i think 50 or 60 uh different vaccine developments and drug development experiments going on so hopefully we'll get one the other one is about the containment so uh, hopefully we'll contain it to a, a smaller area and that area might be might have a lot of the patients might have a lot of mortality rate but it may not be global we might be uh, already away from that 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 possibility it has been global so but but uh, historically ebola did not uh, go as much as it's good and same with the SARS. The other one is the natural trickle off, that is the Spanish flu. So Spanish flu was so deadly that it would kill its host, uh, kill its host and it wouldn't get any more susceptible host. So there was no way it can reproduce and get, get more of the uh, viral. Uh, <laughs> it cannot reproduce or replicate its viral genome. So that might be the other way. And, and and hope let's hope that will run be the way and from the experiments and from what we have seen and from the, all the medical advancements now hopefully that will not be the case so the best case scenario uh, we would be looking here is either vaccine drugs and the combination of vaccine and drugs and hopefully the pandemic the endemic with all with all these mutations so on the drugs we also want to discuss yesterday Sisi discussed a little bit about the vaccine development process and a little bit of the drug development process. So I also wanted to uh, add a little bit on the drugs development uh, efforts going on right now. And I'll uh, invite Sisi back again to discuss about these different, uh, different drugs. They are trying to act on different pathways of these, uh, mm, oops, uh, pathways of these, uh, 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 of the coronavirus infection. Cecil? Yeah. So basically, I think I don't need to share. Uh, so basically, it's just the understand the how the pathway works, right? Uh, are you hearing me? Yes, we are. Um, oh, okay. So, so this is the spike protein, and there are these receptors. So first target, can we hold it here, right? Can we have this, this receptor binding? Uh, not occurring so that we don't need to even uh, the virus won't even enter inside our cells and over here we talked about briefly talked about yesterday during vaccine development about covalescent plasma that is when you have infected somebody gets infected and they develop antibody and you find out uh, they also have these uh, uh, antibodies with biometric analysis and structure analysis you come up with this candidate pro uh, antigen so if you bind those if you use those then that will be also uh, working as blocker at this point so at this uh, these are two different ways you can block receptors or you can block 
the spike protein itself, right? And then if it, if it gets endocytosed, then there are the mechanisms where all the lipid uh, uh, bioprocesses, right? How lipid forms and there are different types of lipids. So there are these chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine that will act uh, and inhibit this lipid formation. Basically, you don't allow it to form this uh, vacuoles and somehow the cell protease system gets activated or they find out these viruses particles and they degrade it over this point and now somehow uh, it gets let's say that also doesn't work then you have the genomic uh, release and translation process uh, where where you can especially on this part where there are the RDP this is remdesivir drug and this is a analog for ATP and so you need ATP is like a powerhouse. So you need uh, ATP for reactions to occur. So this is the analog which inhibits replication complex here. So that will be another um, uh, point where you can target this virus. And right now, RDT is is being supervised right in along with other um, drugs. This is made by Gilead, and it also appears a lot of news. And one here, and hydrochloroxin was really popular. The India uh, uh, was one of the top producers of hydrochloroxin and a little bit like a month or so ago, it was really popular, but then they did not find that you know, positive uh, in large pool uh, studies. So this is not that, uh, we don't hear it nowadays. And, and some other related to this interferon is some immune system related. Uh, where you have all this interferon and cytokines producing uh, mechanisms and you just have this repurposing, right? Or previously used drugs and tr try those drugs and see if they can give some positive results. Yeah, so this is kind of uh, try to find a therapeutic uh, approach rather than vaccine. And hopefully if uh, something works out and you can inhibit it during some uh, pathway and it will also uh, inhibit this uh, growth of viral uh, inside host cells. Thanks, Sid. Uh, yeah. So, yep, and, and just, just want to add a little bit on this. A lot of these steps, bioinformatics is always involved in different understanding the pathway and then testing, uh, looking at the similarities of these uh, viruses with some virus, some drug already works. So then, okay, do we have the similarity on certain complex? Now, can we use the same drug because it looks that the, the DNA sequences or the RNA sequences look so similar. So can we work on that? And we tried, and, and a lot of these companies now are trying to come up with either repurpose old drugs or try to make new drugs based on the, our understanding of the genome and how genome it's protein and how it binds to the uh, human cell okay so this is all for today and if you have if you are interested on uh, looking at all these ones uh, please come back tomorrow uh, and next three days where we'll be talking about how a lot of these uh, data analysis is done how we actually say okay uh, this was the reference genome this was we actually used to see d now we see g or uh, what are the different reference genome what was the nepal's nepal's gene what are those some of the india gene and how those different things are so one of the example here is you see, you can see that you see a sequence of cagg and all these different uh, uh, DNA here and if you look at look in the left these are different strains and if you look at this position around 43 it has either A or G and, and based on that which frame it started that was that D to G mutation it was D with, with original A as a nucleotide but when that nucleotide became G that became the G mutation so that's how we, we uh, align these sequences so uh, come back tomorrow and next three days to understand how actually we sequence them and how we align them to the reference genome and say, okay, these are the mutations we are seeing. Uh, with that, our talk on the coronavirus and this uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is complete. And uh, one, one difference from yesterday, we'll take the questions right away because we have more time now. And then after uh, we're done with some questions and how much time we have, we'll go to the RICE genomics. Thanks, Radhika.
Thank you, Dr. Rajare and um, CC Subiri. Uh, I hope um, you realized how much efforts from the global scientists have been put together to understand the coronavirus genome and its evolution. Um, genome, um, understanding the evolution of the coronavirus and its complete um, genetics is very important to understand the coronavirus um, uh, or to, to uh, develop the vaccines. So uh, I'll be reading the questions. The first question is from uh, Rishi Khatri, um, either to CC or Dr. Achade. Is it normal to have many mutations in such a short span? How often does this incidence occur during the evolution process? Uh, so I think I, I can take that one. Uh, generally, we see more uh, mutations in viral virus then in bacteria or eukaryotes or uh, other other organisms so uh, and i think the rate uh, the rate of mutation might be different but the good thing is the, the one of the problem with the virus or let's say in, in, in the prokaryotes is that um, almost all of the their uh, sequences are coding for something so when we see some mutations most of the time they are though in, the, in within, the, within the genic sequences so they actually if they are non-synonymous, they are going to affect something. So it is common to see those mutations. It is not out of ordinary. Thank you, Dr. Achari. So next question is from Suman Dungil. So he's asking, although there are several variants on the virus, why is it severely called that genome is still stable? So, so Jen, so we usually call, so even though there are a lot of mutations there, the mutations are in the multivariable, highly polymorphic regions, but, but there are those stable regions, meaning like you, you need certain structure for st uh, spike protein to buy, form its structure, right? And you need those RNA polymerase reaction machineries. So as long as you don't have mutation in those critical regions, those will be still stable and alive and will be able to replicate. So for it's all about survival and replication. It's only trying to uh, take, take, capture host machinery and then replicate as long as it, it, want, it can, right? So as long as you have stable mutation in those critical, uh, you can say evolutionary conserved uh, reasons, you are call, you, those uh, virus will be stable and it will be keep replicating. And Dr. Acharya also showed one, uh, uh, phylogenic uh, amino acid or nucleotide comparison over there where you saw that there were mutations, those uh, virus were defined differently just based on the mutation spike proteins, right? So those places where there were no changes and are those, uh, those are the places where those are more conserved and those are needed and critical for virus to be stable and uh, propagation. Thank you, CC. So next question is again from Suman Dungil. He asks, several papers have been published based on the clinical manifestation of the infection. Does it make sense without studying their genome sequence as a clinical sign and symptoms depends on immunological condition of people? I guess I'll, I'll uh, refer back to my original comment uh, that I'm not a bi virologist. <laughs> so I, I, that, that's, you know, it's, it's, I think there are a lot of other things than uh, in, in generally genome by environment and the other immunological, immunological uh, uh, responses and the environment itself creates, you know, the immune response. So what we are showing here is more on the how it got from the genomic evolution side and the genomic understanding. But I think uh, probably uh, a lot of the, it depends on personal immunological uh, conditions or you know, where the environment are. And also we have seen different races or different sex, female, male, there are differences between those. Thank you, Dr. Achari. Next question is from Dinesh Panta. He's asking, Nepal has no serious cases, or at least not in the data. Does this have to do something with the strains? Have we studied about this? So, uh, go ahead, Sir. Yeah, so, uh, so this is very interesting because we, in India, there are a lot of cases. And in Nepal, uh, we, we can't say uh, that uh, there are no serious cases yet because 
uh, it's still we're in the middle of it. And right now it's, it looks like the pandemic is going down. I think right now we have, we are around hundred something per day and we were definitely going down from 600. But to understand uh, what's going on, we really have no data other than how many people are getting t tested and got positive and the mortality rate, right? Usually the mortality rate is remaining low because the initial seed infection were, uh, uh, were occurring in uh, more young people and who went outside and came back to their country. So this is still debatable. And we do need to do this genomic analysis and further study to conclusively say that uh, there is no serious cases or what the, to understand the geographical aspect of this uh, pandemic in uh, Nepal. Dr. Acharya, you have see something? Um, anything, Dr. Acharya, on this topic? Uh, no, I, th I think uh, that no serious case, I don't know how, uh, yeah, what was the meaning. Just the Z mutation is not really the serious. It is just, it is more infectious, but we don't know the severity. So even if Nepal doesn't have Z, that doesn't mean it is not serious. And the other thing is the sequence we have right now is was sequenced back in January. So we actually do not have the sequences from newly uh, infected patients. So we don't know that. Um, thank you. So we are getting a lot of questions. Uh, so I um, suggest our speakers to be short. So another question from um, Navin Pandey to everyone. So he asks, if we look overall data of infected people in the world, female are less infected than male. What might be the reason behind it? So I on this point, uh, yeah, it's seeing that uh, female are less infected and also uh, people with uh, uh, from economic, socioeconomic uh, uh, ba background, like such as in U.S., we are seeing that uh, Hispanic and African American people, they are more uh, the mortality is high compared to uh, American pe people, right? So with females, also it may be something to do with how the previous infections or how the system is built to fight against uh, uh, this uh, immunological. Uh, occurrences that prevail that were prevalent in their uh, certain mechanisms in previous uh, days. Thank you, Sisir. So another question is from Soros Kanal. He asks, "Is COVID nineteen as COVID nineteen is going, the continuous mutation in different genes and the protein they code? Is it possible for a developed vaccine to work for a longer time, like after three years or more?" I, I think it will again depend on uh, what, how much it will mutate. So if it becomes like the flu, so we have the, for the flu, we have the vaccines every year and those vaccines are developed based on different mutations we see last year and what are the mutations we see last year and what is the frequency of that and based on that study, what might be the prevalent strain next year and that's how they will develop the vaccines for next year. So I think it becomes, if it becomes that pandemic, pandemic kind of thing, then probably that is what is going to happen. But if only few proteins, let's say ORF or S protein are going to say muted, but some of the, let's say, nuclear cosmic proteins are not mutating and, and uh, the, re the reaction of those antibodies are actually with, with the, uh, that given given protein that might work. So, but again, it will depend on how, what is the direction that mutation goes. Thank you, Dr. Achare. So another question is uh, from Sandeep Pokhril, somewhat related and I, you might have answered it. So if mutation is so rapid, is it possible to develop vaccine? If so, possible, it is limited. Yeah, so this is definitely a problem because if uh, initial drug vaccine, like right now we are seeing this prevalence of G mutation and if the vaccines, uh, uh, were developed using demutation, then we'll definitely have issues. And that's the reason there are multiple companies working and multiple approaches that we briefly mentioned yesterday. And also this the therapeutic approach that we discussed. So yes, so if there is the target definitely lies in the exactly uh, one region and then that region somehow gets mutated and uh, it gets evolved, then those vaccines may not, most likely won't work. So that is possible. Thank you. The similar question, and I think it has been answered uh, by Amit 
um, the question is by Amit Gewali. Does mutation has caused difficulties in development of vaccine? I think CC just answered that. So I'll move to another question from Saurabh to um, both of you. Patanjali Institute, Institute released medicine and claimed that it will cure COVID-19, but it was dragged into controversy. Please give information whether Ayurvedic medicine was effective or not. Uh, so again, as so, some of the controversies we cannot answer, and we can only answer based on the genetic basis. Uh, but from the from India itself has uh, said that that is not true, and a lot of the scientific evidences are that that is uh, the the one that Patanjali uh, is claiming that it cures COVID nineteen is not true. But it doesn't mean that Ayurvedic medicines may not work. It may not work for this one for impact. Uh, for immediate action, but there might be Ayurvedic ways uh, that will increase your immunity power and those kind of things. Uh, so uh, again, that is the uh, that is based on a lot of the discussions that we have not seen any Ayurvedic or non-Ayurvedic medicines yet. So, thank you. Uh, another question from Dr. Naresh Kumar Saha. According to WHO, none of the vegetarian people get infected with COVID-19 because it needs animal protein to multiply. What do we say on this matter? Uh, I, uh, I'm not sure uh, the we I think we about this uh, uh, data. So we just right now I I don't think this is conclusive that you are vegetarian people are not getting infected or the what is the mortality rate and you know, just needs animal protein to multiply like biologically and with the data that we have right now and understanding of this virus how it enters into mm -hmm. cells and how it multiplies, we definitely uh, don't see exactly why something specific to animal protein uh, would be required, but this needs further investigation. Thank you. Another question from Rohini Choudhury. Can translation repression control the reduction of viral protein? Uh, this also, like, uh, the in the slide one of the, the slides that we presented we did so that trans, translation uh, was also one of the target and uh, definitely it will reduce or if, they, if we find some target that works uh, in terms of uh, higher activity of proteases or some other mechanisms then it will reduce viral protein i think we need to move to the next presentation and we can answer uh, in the chat box so that we will save the time Radhika? Uh, so we move to another session. I think we still have 15 minutes time. Okay. Uh, let's take two more questions and then let's move to uh, the another session. And then if we have questions, then we can again come back to these these ones. Okay. Uh, sounds good. So one of the question is from Deepak Bista. Does the infection of coronavirus shows the association with uh, different blood groups? Uh, I think there was just. Uh, Two or three days ago, there was a study, and 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 like this is a evolving field, and there has been so many researches going on. But yes, we heard that some of the blood groups uh, are infected more than other ones. But we we uh, because these are just based on the these are not proper testing. These are based on what we see in the data. It is kind of survey data, or it is kind of. Uh, let's say okay this is not a proper experiment but this is just a okay we see 10 percent of uh, a b positive showing the symptoms we see uh, 15 percent showing the o positive so it might be that we had less data or we had some data bias problem but there are some reports that different blood groups uh, uh, respond differently thank you so this will be the final question um for now, we'll take again at the end if we have more time. This question is from Dinesh Kanal. How does coronavirus, coronavirus change it itself throughout the different locations? Is it only by mutation? Yes, it, it is by mutation uh, because uh, once a mutation changes, the genomic architecture changes and it gets mutated and uh, like different clades and maybe it gets into completely different form of virus, so it is by mutation. Um, so we'll end for now. Thank you so much, Dr. Anantachare and C.C. Supiri for such an informative um, talk on coronavirus genome and evolution. So our next talk 
uh, is going to be on rice genomics and diversity in Nepalese context. This will be co-presented by Dr. Dave Powell and Dr. Soros Parajuli. Um, both Dr. Parajuli and Dr. Um, Powell are postdoctoral associate at uh, University of Florida, the Florida Jewers. Can everyone see the slide? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Bartola. And good morning, everyone in Nepal, and good evening, everyone in US and everywhere else. So, first of all, I would like to thank Napa and AFU for for this platform, and I would also like to thank all our participants for making this happen today. Myself and Dr. De Porel. We are going to talk about the genome sequencing in rice, where they have sequenced around 3,000 rice assessment from Asia. And I will be covering the first part mainly on the rice genome, the, what has been published in the paper, and, and some data from there. And the second part will be done by Dr. De Portel, and you will be focusing on the Nepalese assessments and, and their polymorphism. So before beginning the slide on rice genome, I would like to talk about myself, my background. So I'm native of Krishnapur Chiton, which is around like eight, eight kilometers away from the AFU main campus. And I did my schooling from Balmiki Sitchasadam. And my high school was from Orchid Science College. I did my BSc AG and graduated in 2010 from IAS Rampur. I did my master's in plant breeding and genetics from IAS Rampur in 2013. During that time, my research was focused on production of maize hybrid and evaluation of those hybrid for drought and low nitrogen stress. And after graduating in 2013, I moved to University of Florida to pursue my PhD degree. So during my PhD, my research was focused on metabolic engineering of sugarcane. So every one of us has heard about sugarcane, but my research was focused on converting those sugarcane into oil cane. So what, what we have done is we have targeted few genes in the triacyl glycerol biosynthetic pathway, and we have modified the whole pathway to convert the sucrose in the, present in the stem into the oil. So as you see in the falcon tube on the top, so in the top portion, there is the oil layer that has been extracted from the transgenic sugar cane, which we call it oil cane, because instead of sugar, it has oil in the stem. So, and those oil can be converted into biodiesel for, for the renewable source of fuel. And after graduating my PhD degree in 2016, I accepted a position, postdoctoral position in University of Florida. And currently, I'm working on citrus genome editing. So I work on CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing technique to target the susceptible genes and increase the resistance against the citrus greening or bungling wing disease. So let's move to the genome paper. So we are focusing on the rice genome paper that was published in Nature in 2018. So the title of the paper is Genomic Variation in 3010 Diverse Assessment of Asian Cultivated Rice. So before moving to the paper, I would like to focus on some of the keywords so that it will help us understand the paper in, in much better way. So I'll just talk about the keyword and we'll cover the description on the coming lectures. So pangenome SNP is like Single nucleotide polymorphism, SP, is structural variation, red seek, red, that is the reference sequence, and that was Nippon Bear from Orasia, and NCBI database, admixture, synteny, core genes, and distributed genes. So these eight and nine core and distributed genes, they form the pan genome, and biallelic, meaning like there are two alleles, indels, insertion and deletions, 
and the haplotype. So let's move to the paper and like scientists consider rice as a model experimental crop. Why? Why we consider rice as a model experimental crop? So there are many reasons behind this and I'm summarizing in five different ways. So the first one is the small genome size. The genome size of rice is around 400 to 430 base pair, sorry, megabase. So the rice genome it was one of the early plant genome or the crop genome that has been sequenced and it was sequenced around 2000 so that was the time when human genome was sequenced so that means rice genome has been sequenced very early compared with other crops and the sequencing was done by Monsanto and there are two different papers in nature published on rice genome at the same year in 2002 so on the on the right this figure shows the synthetic Synthetic is the like physical co-location of the genes in the chromosome across the different species. So in, in, in the center, the orange color represents the rice genome, which is 430 MB in size. And as we move away from the center, the, the size of the genome goes and increasing. And the, this one is the green color is the foster millet, which is 490 base pair, sorry megabase in size and the light green color is the sorghum genome which is 400 sorry which is 700 megabase in size and the pink color represents the maize genome which is 2.4 gigabase in size and on the outer core we see the wheat genome which is the largest and the complex genome that is 17 gigabase in size and this is called complex genome because it is hexaploid in nature and the mode of inheritance is very complex and number two, why we consider rice as an experimental model crop. So it is deployed, it has only two set of chromosomes and it is, its mode of inheritance is disomic and it is also self pollinated. This makes rice easier to study. And it has short life cycle that is around 90 to 120 days. And it is also very easy to transform compared with other cereals and we can easily generate the mutant and we can study the function of the gene. And last, it has wide genetic diversity and it is one of the most diverse crop in the cereal family. And for this study, the authors have collected the rice assessments from GeneBank and ERI. So there are more than 780,000 rice assessments available in the GeneBank and ERI. And out of that, they selected 3,000 rice assessment from the Asia region. And in this study, there are four different groups of rice population, and two of them are major type, that is the Oriza Sativa Indica group, denoted as XI. So let's like let's not be confused with XI. We, we just we can just now focus on the second letter I. I means indica. And the second major type of what I just said about is Japonica group, GJ. So we just focus on the J letter. So that is called Japonica group. And there are two other distinct groups. That is Os, Boro, and Reda ecotype, denoted as CA. And the Basmati and Sadri ecotype, denoted as CB. And there were four different objectives of this study. And the first objective is to study the genetic variation. For the genetic variation, single nucleotide polymorphism at, at different locations were studied. And the second objective was to study the structural variation, like deletion, insertion, inversion, and translocation. And the third objective was the construction of the pan genome. So pan genome is the total gene and gene family present in that population. So core, core gene consists of those genes that are present in all of those pop, all the assessments in the population and the unique gene consists of the only those genes that are in that particular individual genotype and the first objective is to was to study the evolution and domestication of the rice so let's go to sampling and sequencing so for sampling they collected the seed from iri and jinbeng as i have already discussed and after collecting the seed, they, they, 
they grew the seed and they extracted the DNA from the leaf sample and they have used three micrograms that is around 3000 nanogram of DNA, genomic DNA and those genomic DNA were fragmented by using sonication method and the site selection was done by electrophoresis and barcoding and indexing was done to do the further sequencing and for sequencing they used the recent technology Illumina ISIC 2000 platform and from there they first sequenced around 3024 genotype but 14 of them had very low low quality so finally they only studied the 3010 genomes and the sequencing depth varied from four times to 50 times and the genomic genome size varied from 375 megabits to 430 megabits so coming to the data analysis after after getting the raw data from the HiSeq 2000 platform first step they did was to check the quality of the raw data those are fast queue format and quality was checked by using the fast QC software and after checking the quality the trimming was done why trimming is necessary because when we sequence the gene fragment then then like sequencing primer index primer and barcode are added as we can see the in the figure on the right so the black person represents the sequence of the interest and the multicolor like red color green color and other color are the index primer and the barcode so they have to be removed, be removed before aligning to the reference genome so after trimming by using the trimomatic software the the raw read were aligned to the reference genome which is nippon beer in this case by using the pwmm software and as you see in the lower figure so the first line is the reference sequence and the lower line if we count there are seven different read so this is called the sequencing depth means this is seven times seven x is the sequencing depth for this example and from all those read they finally get the consensus sequence that is like t is available in most of the read means t is the base at this location similarly there are six c and a single t means the nucleotide at this location is c so after aligning to the reference genome they they did the variant calling by using the gatk and bcf tool and the further analysis was done for genetic and structural variation and pan genome construction and domestication study and the evolution study of the evolution and coming to the population structure and diversity those 3000 SSM based on the sequence information and the single nucleotide polymorphism data those 3000 SSM were classified into nine different subpopulation and XI as we have to just consider the I on the after X so this is the indica group and the other one is a japonica group so in the indica group there are four different subpopulation and this subpopulation could be connected to the geographic location so 1a that subpopulation is from the east asia region 1b is the modern varieties and xi the indica 2 group those are from the south asia region and indica 3 those are from southeast asia region so as we can see in the phylogenetic tree on the left side so x1a x1b x1 2 and 3 those are represented in multiple green color and we can see most of the most of those subpopulation are present in the top portion of the dendrogram means the one side of the dendrogram most of the population are from the indica cluster and the different color represent the different subpopulation within the indica group and coming to the japonica cluster there are three different japonica cluster the first one is the temperate subtropical second one and the third one is the tropical subpopulation and they can be re related to the different geographical location so temperate is related to east asian temperate 
and subtropical is Southeast Asian subtropical and tropical is Southeast Asian tropical. And these Japanica clusters, they are present in the lower side of the phylogenetic tree and two other population are the OS group CA and the basmati group CB. So the OS group CA is represented by orange color. We can see on the side of the dendrogram. Similarly, the purple color, they represent the basmati group. And there is admixture from the indica group, admixture from the japonica group, and the overall admixture within the population. So let's move to the nucleotide diversity. So from this 3010 accessions, a total of 29 million SNPs were called. Out of those 29 million SNPs, 27 million SNPs were biallelic and 2 million were the indels. Those are insertion and deletion of less than 40 base pairs in size. And after filtering, they, they recovered 14, sorry, they recovered 17 million SNPs and out of them, 400,000 were the core SNP data set. So as we move to the figure on the top, it represents the nucleotide diversity and on the y-axis and on the x-axis, it is the chromosome 4 position. And in the chromosome 4, there is a locus SS4 and this locus SS4 is related to non-saturating trait. So if we see the nucleotide diversity of this SS4 locus, this one is very, very low. That means the nucleotide diversity among different subpopulation for this trait is lower. And this could have been selected since the dom domestication and its diversity is very low. And if we see the surrounding nucleotides or maybe the gene region, then the, we can see the nucleotide diversity that is represented by pi is higher. And coming to the structural variation, so it was also called on 3010 assessments, but they, they mainly focused on the 453 assessment because the quality of other assessments were lower. And those 453 assessments had more than 20 times sequence depth. And from here, they called 93,000 structural variation. And out of this, average of 12,000 structural variation are present per genome. That is the average number. And they also noticed like more than 500 KB of structural variation was seen in more than 500 different locations. That is the average number. And coming to the bar diagram on the left, this was the duplication, inversion, deletion, and translocation of the different population. So if we see the duplication, then on the y-axis, this is the event number, total number of event, and that is in comparison with the reference sequence, that's Nippon Bear, and the red color represent the indica, so indica group, and blue color represent the Japonica group, yellow color represent the OS group, and purple color represent the Basmati group, and we also have the admixture. So if we see, if we compare only the Indica and Japonica group, then in all of the event, duplication, inversion, deletion, and translocation, we can see the number of, sorry, number of event are, number of structural variation are higher in Indica group compared with the Japonica group. And similarly, if we see the other group, then they are in between the Indica and the Japonica group. And the average size of the deletion was, around 5 kb in size and average size of inversion was 19 kb and the duplication was very high it was like 5, 105 kb this is very high in size and coming to the pan genome construction of what is the they used the map to pan strategy for making the pan genome so since the quality of all the assessments were not good they used only 453 assessments to construct the pan genome so as you see in the figure A, so the y-axis represent the accession number, those are 453 in number, and the x-axis represent the gene family. Total gene family in the pan genome is 23,876. So if we see the red region and the blue region, red region is the presence of the 
Jin family in that particular accession. And blue color represent the essence of those Jin family in that particular accession. So the accession will go will go horizontal, and the Jin family goes vertical. And if we see in the figure B pangenome, so the fifty three percent of the pangenome was the core pangenome, means presence of all those Jin families in all those accessions, means that makes the core core pangenome and distributed pangenome those are not present in all of the accessions but they are present in the individual accessions so they they form the distributed pangenome they are distributed in some of the population within the with, with, within those 453 accessions and if, if we look the individual genome then in the individual genome 63 percent contribute to the core in the pangenome and 26% are the distributed gene family in the in the pangenome. So they also studied the evolution and domestication. And for, for studying the evolution and domestication, they used the protein sequence from those rice accessions and aligned them to NCBR NR protein database. So here is the link for NCBI NR protein database. So we can use this link. We can use this link to the to go to the protein database. So what they found after aligning them to the protein database was they found th thirteen different taxonomic level of partition. And if we see the evolution, so the PS one that is at the single cellular organism level. So fifteen thousand and eight hundred gene were evolved at that time. And as we move up in the evolution. So when we come to the PS12, that is the evolution of Oriza, that like the there is the highest number of gene emerged at that time at P, at PS12 taxonomic level. And if we go to PS13, that is the Oriza sativa level. So at that time, 168 genes were evolved at that time. So those could be the domesticated genes. And SNP variation were higher in core gene compared with the sorry the the SNP variation will always be lower in the core genes compared with the distributed genes. And coming to the haplotype analysis and interrogation, so in the in the figure on the left, the y-axis represent the. Y axis represents the nine different domesticated genes, and X axis represents the samples, means there are 789 Indica samples. So, we, this is only for the Indica sample. And the green color represents the non interrogation, means there is no interrogation from the Japanica group. And light orange color represents the interrogation from Japanica haplotype. So if we see the QSS1 gene towards the lower of the graph, so that represents there is very less interrogation from Japanica subgroup. But as we move up towards the other domesticated genes, and if we go to PS4, then there is the highest level of interrogation from Japanica group. So we can see so around 70% of the Indica accession they don't have the haplotype inter interrogation from the Japanica group in, in the lower four different genes. And to summarize this study, they, they identified around 3,000, they studied 3,000 accessions and classified them into nine different subpopulations. And a total of 29 million SNPs were called, called for the whole study and out of that 400,000 were the whole core SNP data set and a total of 93,000 structural variation were identified and core pangenome was formed by 53% of the gene family and core pangenome core gene in the pangenome were more ancient compared with the compared with the distributed genes so how can scientists make the good use of this information available in the database so I have shown three different ways. First one is the trait selection from the germplasm. Suppose we are looking for some 
some trade that is high yielding or maybe that is quantitative trade. But if you look at certain trade like root length, then then to introduce the longer root length in our breeding population, we can look at both genomic data and morphophysiological data and identify the genotype to introduce in our breeding population. And second one would be to do the gene expression study. For this, we have to first clone the gene and express them in the plasmid. And after expressing them in the plasmid, we, we need to transform them in the rice plant so that we can see the effect of gene expression at, at, at different stages. And the third one, this one is the most popular nowadays. So this is for genome editing and study of the gene function. So this is done by CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing technique. So if we are interested in a particular trait or if we find some trait and we want to know the function, then the first thing to do is to knock the gene out. And after we knock the gene out, we, there is no function for such gene. And when we do further analysis, and if we don't see that particular function after knocking the gene out, then, then we can identify the function of the gene and we know, okay, this gene is governing this type of function in the, in the rice. So thank you everyone for, for being here. And the next part of the rice genome will be covered by Dr. Deporter. Thank you, uh, Dr. Parajil, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, okay, perfect. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Today I'm going to talk about uh, genomics and diversity of Nepalese rice genotypes. And for most of this work, uh, this will be taken from the uh, paper that Dr. Parajil just presented just now. Uh, before moving into the actual topic, uh, I'd like to briefly introduce uh, my background to you all. Uh, I finished my bachelor's in agriculture from Rampur campus in 2009. After that, I worked uh, shortly as a horticulture development officer in Dado Sinduli. Then I moved to uh, Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas for my master's in crop science. There I worked on cotton breeding program. And after my master's, I worked uh, as a technician in Texas A&M AgriLife Research for a project that was growing algae for biofuel. I worked there for two years. And then I moved to the University of Florida for my PhD. Uh, my PhD was focused on developing genomic and breeding resources for napier grass, which is also known as elephant grass. And after uh, finishing my PhD, I'm currently a postdoctoral associate at UF. Uh, and currently I'm working on breeding and genomics of cowpea as well as turf grass. And today in my uh, presentation, we will uh, get into a little bit into the details of the uh, paper that Dr. Parajali just presented and how we can actually utilize the data that they have, uh, uh, that they have uh, released publicly. So if you go to the website that is uh, shown on the top of my slide, this is the website where the authors have uh, deposited all their genome sequencing data. There is a ton of data on the 2010 accessions that the uh, authors had uh, sequenced. And in order to, considering the uh, audience, in order to you know, analyze all this data, I want to introduce you to a commonly used uh, software known as TASL, which is uh, commonly used to evaluate trait associations and do evolutionary studies. This is a, a graphical user interface. So for people who are just embarking on their journey to you know, DNA sequence analysis and or population genetics, this will be a very uh, easy software in order to uh, get hands-on. Uh, this is this software is freely available from a Buckler's lab at Cornell. And as Dr. Parajali uh, already mentioned, uh, the uh, the authors they filtered a total of 29 million biallelic SNPs from the 3010 accessions of uh, rice varieties all over the world. And from that uh, 29 million SNPs, they developed a core set of SNPs of uh, considering a total of 404,000 high quality core SNPs from the 29 million SNPs. So with this core SNP, I have done a few analyses uh, based on uh, the accessions that were included from Nepal. And I took the 
four SNP data set that had 404,000 biallelic SNPs. The data, if you go to the website, if you go to this website uh, that is given right here, there you will, you can get access to all this data and this data is also freely available for you to download. And uh, here I'm presenting a list of all the, uh, all the NIPLIS accessions that were included in this study. And uh, there were a total of 44 uh, NIPLIS accessions that were included. You can see that uh, some of uh, the uh, famous accessions like Anadi, Junge Marsi, Ghaya, Seto Jinua, as well as Ratu Basmati is included in this data set. And for, uh, from all the accessions, what they did was they, extracted DNA from the leaves. Once you have uh, the DNA is extracted, they sequence the DNA, and then we move ahead with different bioinformatic tools to process the sequencing reads. And when I, what I mean by a sequencing read is just a, a sequence of ATGC, where, which you can see here. So it is usually uh, 100 to 300 base pairs if uh, it is a sequence from an Illumina sequencer. So this part, of 100 to 150 base pair or even longer based on new sequencing technologies that have come these days. We call this uh, individual as a sequence read. And what we do is we compare uh, these reads from different genotypes and then see what, what is the difference between those two genotypes. So if you compare these two reads right here, you can see that on the top read there is a C, but on the bottom read there is A. So this is what we call as a SNP. So if there is a polymorphism at one nucleotide, we reference this as a single nucleotide polymorphism. And let me talk a little bit about how this will impact. So when uh, this is transcribed and translated into a protein, uh, for the top read, it will give you a protein, a really long sequence of protein. But if you take a look at the uh, sequence on the bottom, what happens is as uh, you translate it and you come up to this point, it will be a UAA and that uh, the translation machinery just stops there because it is a stop codon. So what happens is this, the top protein will give you a different phenotype and the bottom protein will give you a different phenotype. And this, uh, this is what we see when we actually observe the phenotype uh, in the field. And a basic uh, pipeline that that you guys can use uh, to get started is, you know, you can go ahead and download the 400, 4,000 core SNP data set that is available in the website. And you can use uh, different softwares like uh, Plink, BCF tools or Tassel. And there are a lot of other softwares that we commonly use uh, in bioinformatics. So from Plink, you can uh, convert the Plink files to a file called .bcf, which is a variant call format. Uh, it just shows uh, the type of SNP, the depth, and a lot of other information related to those SNPs. And uh, there are a lot of uh, things that you can do with BCF tools. Uh, and primarily in this uh, scenario, I use BCF tools to extract the set of NIPLIS accessions from the whole set of 3010 accessions. And then to draw a file genetic tree and PCA, I use Tassel, but you can use, there are a lot of other softwares that do this job. And here I want to introduce to you the, the interface of Tassel. So once you open a file in Tassel, this is how it will look like. Uh, on the left-hand side, uh, this uh, you can see these are the name of the accessions that we have here. And on the top right here, the uh, represented by one and two, this is the chromosome number. And on top, this would be the location of each individual SNP at that chromosome and all the ATGCs that you can see in this uh, uh, figure here represent the SNPs that are present in this genotype at this locus. So for each individual locus, you will, you will see what type of SNP is present at that point. And in the publicly available uh, database, uh, this figure shows you the number of reads that are present for the uh, NIPLIS accessions. So for the 44 accessions, you can see that most of the uh, accessions have more than 50 million reads uh, in that database. So you can easily go ahead and extract those reads in order to do your own analysis. 
Uh, this figure shows the uh, number of SNPs per chromosome. So on the x-axis is the number of chromosomes uh, in rice, so which will be 12. And on the y-axis is the number of SNPs that are uh, present in, in the core SNP data set. So we can see that uh, at least all of the uh, chromosomes have more than 20,000 SNPs in each chromosome. So this, you know that this SNP set is highly dense and you can do a lot of analysis moving forward. And this is the principal component analysis of the 3010 accessions. Uh, each individual dot that you can see here represents one accession and individual closer to each other are generally clustered together. Like these individuals uh, right here are close to each other. And what is more interesting to us would be the principal component of the Nephilim accessions. So again, this figure shows the uh, two principal components for the uh, Nephilim accessions and all the accessions that have a square are from uh, Nepal. The accessions that is a triangle is from Japan and a circle is from India where a plus is from Pakistan. I just included a few lines from India, Japan and Pakistan to see where they are actually located. And the uh, color of uh, each genotype shows the, uh, the, the group with which uh, they were uh, represented in the original paper presented. And uh, there's something interesting that you can see in this graph. For example, Rato Basmati, which is the uh, Nepalese Basmati li line that was included in this study is clustered here. Whereas the Pusa Basmati, which is a, a Basmati line from Pakistan, it is clustered uh, at a different location. Whereas the Basmati, which is from India is again clustered at a, a, it clusters at a different location. So you can see that these three, uh, even though they are all Basmatis, they are uh, separately clustered. And the other thing is, uh, you can see a lot of uh, Nepalese uh, varieties, uh, including the Ghayadhan is uh, clustered separately below in a separate cluster. Next, what we can do with this uh, type of data is we can go ahead and do a phylogenetic analysis for, for all these accessions. And uh, again, this figure shows you a never winning tree for the Nepalese accessions that were included. And, I'm including uh, Nippon Bar and uh, Basmati from India just as a reference. And you can see that Rato Basmati is uh, up here, whereas the Basmati line from India is uh, way below in a, in a separate level. So uh, you can do this type of analysis based on all the uh, publicly available data. And moving forward, you can, uh, if you are, uh, if you want to do more advanced studies like genome-wide association studies, then there is uh, other tools called uh, GAPIT. You can see the website given on the top. So you can use GAPIT to do uh, genome-wide association studies, as well as you know do uh, phylogenetic studies or do other population genetic studies. And again, this uh, GAPIT is based on R and it is also free and open source. So if you are interested, I encourage you to go ahead and explore. And this data set, we can uh, use these uh, publicly available uh, sequence data to, you know, you can go ahead to develop SNP-based markers or develop uh, SSR markers. You can also use them to understand the genetic basis of complex traits, identify disease resistant genes, genes and to do comparative genomics. Uh, you can also move ahead to do genome-wide association studies, but it requires a much larger population and, you know, only uh, around 44, uh, genotypes from Nepal were included in this study, so it wouldn't be as powerful. Uh, you can use uh, sequences to do QTL uh, mapping to, to identify the locus that corresponds to a particular trait. And you, know, you can actually apply SNP data in genomic selection in order to uh, improve your breeding program as well. With that, uh, I'd like to end my talk with this brief introduction, and I'd also like to encourage all of you to join our uh, workshop from tomorrow, which is going to be for the next three days in which we will be doing most of the work that I did. So I did in rice and you know, tomorrow we'll be mostly focusing on the genome of uh, coronavirus, which is a very uh, small genome. So it will be you know, easier to do all the analysis and it will be less computer intensive. So for the uh, next three days, uh, we will have those workshop uh, coming up and it will come up in the same Zoom link that we have sent to you. So I hope to see much of you there. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask now. Thank you, Dr. Parajili and Dr. Podel for such an informative talk on RICE genome. Uh -huh.
um, it was really exciting to hear that our own Nepalese um, cultivars have been included in this 3000 rice genome project. Um, so we encourage all the uh, participants to ask questions. So I'll start with the first question we have here. Um, it's from Babar Usman. How can we use this information for genome editing? Procedure, please. Okay, I, I'll get that question. So actually this is very nice question. And this is the beauty of genome sequencing. Like we have sequenced more than 3000 genome and like much much more genome are available in, in public so that means if you are looking at, at for example like i would like to give example of a disease so if you are looking for disease re resistance then what can happen is like there are a lot of cultivars and a lot of them are sequenced and we also have the morphophysiological -physi data so based on that we can group two, two different type of assessments one would be disease resistance and one would be the susceptible so based on the disease resistance and susceptible we can look at the genome sequence and see the differences so based on the differences we can we can just make some hypothesis like with what type of genome sequence are giving the susceptible and what kind of genome sequence are giving the resistance reaction so based on that we can target the guide RNA to we can design the guide RNA to target that specific region and knock the function of the gene out. And after knocking out, we can see, okay, if that, if that really gives the level of resistance or increases the susceptibility, then we can say, okay, this gene sequence is governing the resistance. If not, then we can, we can move for some other candidate genes in, in, in the same time. Thank you, Dr. Parajuli. Next question is from Sandeep Pokhrel. Um, it's a general question. Gene extraction from leaf, that is vegetative part, can show the similarity to seed extracted gene, which is good tool to identify proper gene sequence. So, okay, I can take that. Uh, so uh, extracting a DNA sequence from both of them, I don't see much problem, but when you extract a DNA sequence from leaves, especially young leaves, they will be of much higher quality. So most of the research uh, that you see is based on usually extracting DNA sequence from young leaves tissues. Thank you, Dr. Pogel. Um, I just want to, I just want to, yeah, I just want to add on that. Uh, so for, because DNA is the, uh, is already in the nucleus, uh, the DNA sequence is same whether it's a leaf or root. So it is the transcriptome, it is the RNA which might be different in seeds versus leaf versus flowers and different parts. So if we are doing expression study with the, uh, expression with the study with the uh, RNA, then that will depend on the, what stage of leaf or uh, whether leaf or seed or root and those kind of things. For DNA, it doesn't really matter. And uh, like Dr. Porrell said, uh, extracting from young leaves is uh, easier than from other places. So that's why we mostly do leaves. Thank you. Um, another general question, any information about the study of Dali Agware Kursani at gene level? Uh, I think that's out of the scope of this workshop. So let's move forward. Yeah. Um, another question from Dinesh Kanal. We have heard a lot of gene ed editing, selection, and many tools, but we, but what would be the true impli implications in our context? For the comparison, how much the crop developed from gene ed editing tools are responding well than the crop developed from traditional breeding method? How can we apply these tools to preserve our land races? I think I can uh, also, I can take that. You can go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, the, the, uh, so first thing is we only probably have one apple and one uh, mushroom now they are you know, genome edited and they are already ready for the consumption so th we do not have any other things uh, that they are ready for from the genome editing work uh, from the GMOs from the transgene uh, we have quite a few so it depends on what is the purpose and what we really want to change so if you look at the GMO uh, 
most of the time it is our, our trait is whether it's a herbicide resistance or uh, Bt, uh, you know, Bt con to get, get that con borer resistance and those kind of things. So if we have a lot of the con borer problem in the field and then rather than applying all those pesticides, it might be easier to use actually the, that Bt con so that we don't get that disease. So it depends on what is the disease pressure and what is the trait and what it has actually made. But for example, in the apple, I think the one it was made is for, against the apple browning. Uh, after you, I think it was for apple browning and that kind of thing. So, and it was hard to probably get a gene that was already available in the apple. When, when we looked into that, let's say for example in the rice, when we looked into 3000 exceptions, probably there were not many genes, uh, not many allelic variations to control for that. So it was easier to edit. And even sometimes, even if it, we find something very similar, uh, I think yesterday Dr. Bortola talked about the linkage drag, you might have a trait and you might have allele and you, you do a traditional plant breeding and a back crossing, but you will still have some linkage drag and you might be uh, getting some of the uh, bad uh, genes, some of the bad alleles, let's say, you know, no, non-desirable alleles from those uh, crops. So that is why actually, if we can just edit that part and make everything intact, that will obviously going to help us. But again, it is based on our understanding of that gene uh, and, and um, based on a lot of the experiments. Talking about the local land, land races, local land races are mostly adapted for that geography, right? So that is exactly why I think the genome editing is better because we can actually use some of the genome editing techniques for desired trait in our local land races and just grow all the local land races with some of the desired traits with the gene editing. Thank you. I also request our participant to please post a question that is relevant to the talk today. So another question is from um, Tian Busal. He asks, is a single gene, example, Florigen based genome comparison possible in rice? Yeah, that is uh, absolutely possible. If you, uh, if you were uh, paid attention to one of the slides uh, in Dr. Parajuli's uh, presentation, you saw that there was a haplotype based analysis based on nine different genes. So we can do a lot of uh, even evolutionary studies based on uh, single genes and they have been done. Thank you. Um, another question is from Satish Podel. He asks, are the researchers relating rhizome incorporation in rice roots and changing metabolism of rice from C3 to C4? Um, yeah, uh, I will add that uh, there have been, I mean, people have been trying to do that, especially, I mean, my previous lab also has been trying to uh, see if we can, you know, introduce uh, like nodulation related genes in rice and see if this will, uh, if this will help in using less amount of nitrogen, but research is still isn't at a, a really high level where you already have a rice that can uh, nodulate or even you know utilize rhizobium. But I mean, people are trying to do, but at this step, uh, I don't think there are any studies that have already been published doing that. And and also to add to that one, so Bill and Mel Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, they have been funding a lot in in this project for the nitrogen fixation in cereals and, and it has been done in MIT and some of the big universities in Europe. Thank you. Another question is from Kesav Raj Pokhril. He asks, can we use the SSR markers for screening blast resistance and drought resistance in rice? Yeah, that is an excellent question. Yeah, I mean, that is why SSR markers would be used. I mean, uh, if you, uh, talk in terms of technology, then SSR markers would be a, a little bit low throughput because you need, uh, you will uh, get less amount of information with SSR markers. Uh, given the same amount of money that you have that you can spend, I think uh, SNP markers will be much cheaper to develop any, uh, uh, to develop any other tools for uh, screening even blast or uh, drought resistance. But, you know, especially for uh, developing countries where we don't have a lot of money that we can spend on sequencing, I mean, still SSR markers uh, would be a really good way to go forward. But you need to have a, a population that is segregating for, for those traits that you are interested in, in order to develop and apply SSR for your breeding program. Thank you. Another general question um, related to the talk, is there any difference in 
Indica and Japonica rise at genome level, like genome size, uh, number of genes, etc. Soros, do you have any information on that? No, uh, I think there is a lot of difference, but I, I'm not, I'm not sure about those. Yeah, please go ahead and uh, read the uh, uh, the article that uh, Dr. Parazuli uh, talked about today. I think it should have all the details about, you know, the tiny, tiny details about the exact number of genes and genome size for the, those different rice exosomes. Thank you. Another question from Umbanath Sharma. For the species where reference genome is not available, how powerful a GWAS uh, study would be? Uh, for uh, species, I mean, this is a common problem with uh, most of the uh, species that we work on, especially in plants, because a lot of plants, they do not have a reference genome already. So what we do is we try to find the closest genome uh, that is uh, related in the same family or, uh, or at a species level. And then we try to map the uh, sequences, raw sequences that we have to that. And that is the only step that where we use a reference genome. And if you don't have a reference genome, you can always do uh, uh, de novo SNP polling. And uh, Dr. Bartola, he, she has also prepared a pipeline called GBS SNP crop, which especially uh, specializes in you know uh, creating a de novo reference for a genome that is not available. Uh, Dr. Bartola, if you want to talk a little bit more about the pipeline. Um, sure. So this pipeline, we basically, uh, like doc, um, Dr. Paul said, we basically designed for those crops are not only um, um, uh, um, limited to crops, but you can use it for animals, uh, feces, modernistas, anything. So what you do in this um, uh, pipeline that we develop is you actually create a mock reference um, sequences from the, the data you have so that even though you do not have the true reference, you can have a mock reference from the data generated um, from your study, and you can use that as a reference genome to call SNPs or indels. So once you call the variants, the process would be similar to how you would analyze the data uh, with, with the, um, the normal pipeline. So another question is from uh, um, Amrit Sarma, so he asks, uh, maybe related to this paper, is SNP analysis only for core genes? Uh, SNP analysis can be done for uh, any DNA sequence, not just genes. So, I mean, we used core genes or a core SNP data set because they were uh, mostly present in most of the uh, accessions that were given and they were uh, really uh, deep. That means they had a lot of uh, DNA sequence information available and they were of high quality but it can be used for any other type of uh, genes or other sequences. Uh, thank you. Another uh, very nice question. How sort reads are capable to identify uh, structural variants in such a diverse germ plasm? So like in Illumina, when we sequence, we sequence around 200 to 300 base pair. That is a single fragment. And when we map them to the reference, so we'll get the sequence at the level of the chromosome. So when we get such a big sequence, then we can surely detect the structural variation of any, any size like deletion, insertion, or, or any type of inversion too. Uh, thank you. So I have a request. Just, one, uh, just want to add on the, the earlier comment uh, that, uh, and there was one of the reasons for the paper, the structural variations were only done at around 400 or so samples because they were in higher depth, they were at least 20x. So if you have the higher depth, then the likelihood of uh, getting that um, structural variation is better because of it will create some contiguous uh, mapping with the, with the reference genome. So thanks. Thank you. Um, I have a request. Uh, our uh, professor, Dr. Madhav Pandey, uh, who is the chair of plant breeding at AFE, he would like to share some um, information. Uh, Dr. Pandey, please go ahead. Uh, Dr. Porin, is he unmuted? I don't see him on the chat. Um, well, in that case, we can come back. We still have uh, a few nice questions. So this is from um, Resam Babu Amagani, and he asks, which one would be best for Nepalese context, GWAS or QTL mapping? Since 
Nepalese um, germplasm uh, has yet to be explored in uh, phenotype and genotype, and still need to increase uh, pace of breeding. Yeah, that is an excellent question. I think uh, my my perspective on this is I think we should move ahead uh, with both of these things parallelly. If we do a GWAS, we can target a lot of different types of traits, uh, including uh, flavor or disease resistance at the same time. But if we have a particular disease that we are interested in and we, we want to move ahead with uh, QTL mapping. And uh, the other thing would be the goal of the uh, breeding project. You know, if you are committed to really developing a, a new variety of rice that is disease resistance or that has a particular trait that you are interested in, then definitely uh, moving ahead with QTL mapping or, or GWAS, would, I mean, both would be better. The good thing about current uh, technology is we have really cheap technologies like genotyping by sequencing that can be used in uh, any uh, plant accessions in order to get the sequence information very cheaply. And you could also leverage the Okay. that we already have in this uh, uh, in this paper for 44 accessions. I think Dr. Pandey is online. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Dr. Pandey, are you here? So, so yes, you... yes, yes. I can hear and uh, whether you can hear me too? <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm Mother Pandey. I currently I chair plant breeding department at Agriculture and Forestry University, Faculty of Agriculture. Um, uh, Dr. Cordelia, who is director of uh, our biotech center, uh, requested me to highlight some of the uh, work we are doing and uh, some of uh, the uh, uh, accomplishments we have uh, so far to share with you. So here we have, uh, uh, within the biotech lab, we have a plant molecular uh, genetics unit. Uh, that uh, actually the history of lab is uh, is, uh, is is a bit longer, but um, since last four or uh, four years actually, um, I've been uh, trying to do some basic uh, molecular work uh, so that we can uh, have some um, uh, marker work and uh, side by side to assist our breeding program. So uh, to highlight some of our work. Uh, we did, uh, we tried to uh, develop um, rice genotype profiling uh, using single uh, seed, that is uh, DNA extracted from the rice, rice grain itself, not from the leaves, so that we can test uh, the genotype uh, variety purity and they are also able to do some adulteration uh, test in the market because uh, there are in the market, there are premium rice, which are often adulterated with uh, coarse rice just by milling and polishing them. And one uh, of our uh, biotech students, she did, uh, Rabina Pandey, she did this work and she established the protocol and tested uh, uh, about 30 SSR markers. Uh, unfortunately, the SSR markers were not so polymorphic as we expected. So uh, she did her uh, thesis work, but the work is uh, still yet to be completed uh, to have a complete uh, protocol for adulteration test and uh, varietal identity. And then we had uh, three, uh, uh, two plant breeding students and one biotech student, master student. They did uh, some gene, uh, uh, gene analysis work in uh, wheat. So we have uh, now information about the reduced height, the, what is called the Green Revolution gene, RST uh, B1 and D1, two genes. Uh, we have diagnostic markers uh, developed for these two genes and they uh, used this uh, diagnostic tool and identified uh, the presence and absence of these genes in uh, about over 40 uh, historical and uh, modern wheat varieties of Nepal. And another student did uh, PPD, which is the photoperiod uh, response gene, uh, important for the adaptation and the, um, actually for the, the DLN period and adaptation uh, of uh, wheat varieties in, 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 a, in a specific condition. So we have also that information for all these um, uh, uh, varieties. 
And recently, uh, we have uh, used our SSR marker for identifying our F1 hybrids. So we have wheat breeding program going on uh, since last four years. So we are about to register some of um, uh, interesting lines and develop at AFU. Actually, the materials are from CIMIT and we have selected them here. And we are also uh, uh, making uh, crosses uh, uh, for uh, population development and ultimately varietal selection. So we are using uh, very basic uh, biotechnological and uh, DNA marker tools in our breeding program. And uh, there was a question about GWAS and uh, QTL mapping, perhaps uh, from uh, Resham uh, Amagai, who was uh, my student long before. So I think these all are uh, depends on you know the uh, the context and the availability of uh, the resources and your objective. So nonetheless, all uh, tools and techniques are important for particular conditions and time. Uh, but considering uh, the resolution and the the, uh, the 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 power of the test, uh, definitely GWAS are more common these days. But nevertheless, QTL mapping is also equally important. These are the basic, you know, the steps on which the other um, uh, techniques are continuously being developed and advanced. So I think that is what uh, I wanted to share with you. So if there are some queries or questions, short questions, I can answer. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for uh, your uh, response. And uh, to that, I want I also want to add that, you know, like uh, genomic selection has been a, a new tool that has been uh, recently developed and is getting more popular. And I think this will also be one of the things that you know, breeders in, in Nepal can actually explore. Uh, yeah, that, that's a long way, uh, um, uh, Dr. Achar, I guess, yeah? Yeah, it was that's a actually yes, I agree with yeah, you. Okay, 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 <laughs> okay, okay. That's a long way, actually. <laughs> no, that, we, yeah. I, I think that, that right now we can use uh, like very basic uh, like markers for disease resistance linked or yeah. diagnostic markers in our breeding program. Uh, the other things are uh, will remain like academic, you know, exercise, and that's uh, that's we have to be very yeah. pragmatic and things. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. that is one of the goals mm -hmm. of this program mm -hmm. as well. Yes. Thank you. Uh, sir, could you please on the video? My video? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm not that. I'm okay. in a very casual, casual. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> okay, I'm muting now. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pandey, for sharing the activities that has been done in Nepal. Um, one of the goal of this um, webinar is actually to um, connect with the researchers like you in Nepal so that we can fill the gap, um, we can bridge the gap and we can use this, all the available modern techniques. And there are a lot of experts here and there, it's just uh, the matter of um, working collaboratively. And I think uh, with this uh, um, seminar and workshop, we hope there will be some joint collaboration in the future so that um, Nepal research can, can move ahead. That's one um, question that um, uh, is interesting and related to the topic. So it is from Travis Koyala. So he asks, how can we sequence more peculiar genes like um, sub-1 genes in case of rice? The reference genome for such genes would be rare. And this would be our last question before we end um, our, our, um, our technical session today. So let me take that one. So for some genes that is very hard to find in the reference genome, you know? So for rice, first thing is like, there are so many genomes that has been sequenced. Maybe we are lucky to find such sequences, but if we cannot find it rice, then we can find in other crops and we can get the sequence from multiple crops and we can align them together and find the consensus sequence to design the primer. So after we de design the different primer set, we can amplify that one in rice and we can just sequence, sequence them. Uh, thank you. Um, I would also like um, our uh, um, professor, Dr. Kaledia, to uh, say some words. Dr. Kaledia, the floor is yours. Uh, no, some of. Uh, 
Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you all of you. And then today we have a nice presentation uh, from two presenters, Dave and Sharoz, and also uh, a good uh, reporter or good uh, moderator, you know, Radhika Gotola. And then it was very interesting and then hope uh, we can materialize it in upcoming days in our academic research and our uh, uh, extension program as well for farmers level. Uh, so I hope uh, we should continue it uh, in upcoming days from different versions or different specific uh, topics as well. Uh, for tomorrow, we will have uh, hands-on training. We will use some basic skills by using uh, some software or some uh, academic uh, level, so course uh, curriculum content. I hope we will cover these topics and then we have very good uh, experts or uh, um, uh, scientists. So all of the participants, please uh, try to continue uh, for upcoming three days and then it will be very good for your uh, uh, careers and then you will get certificates also. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, joining us and then uh, giving time. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kadaria. Um, before I end uh, my session today, so um, there is one question, the common question that has been asked about the tomorrow session. Um, do they need the Linux or window computer? So I would like to hand um, um, and now to Dr. Anand Achare, and I'd like to thank all of the speakers and participants uh, for, um, especially for speakers for giving such uh, interesting talks. And thank you all the participants. So I hand over to Dr. Anand Achare um, to conclude the today's session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bartala. <coughs> And thank you very much to all the speakers today. So we, we, we saw the applications of genomics and biomedicine in two totally different fields. Uh, they are so different, but they are still very similar. Uh, so we, we, we looked into that in that genomics and biomedicine perspective. And, and also thank you to Mother Pandesar uh, for giving us some highlights in the plant breeding uh, efforts in AFU uh, and how we can collaborate. Uh, obviously some of the technologies, we, we, we might be very far away, but uh, maybe we can collaborate more and uh, you know there might be some ways uh, we can collaborate more and work on this one so now talking about tomorrow um, uh, tomorrow and next three days uh, so tomorrow we are going to talk about what we actually need so tomorrow we are first in the very in the beginning we are just going to discuss about the uh, what are the requirements uh, and generally review of molecular uh, small review of molecular biology and a small review of uh, Linux tools uh, that is uh, going to come first. So you don't need a Linux computer. Uh, if if you have a Mac, that is good. Uh, yeah, you, you can work with the Windows, but we'll we'll ask you to install some software in the Windows so that you can connect to the uh, Amazon Cloud or the in in our case it is a Google Compute Cloud. So we have already set up a Google Compute Cloud. Uh, we will ask you to download some software and then install in that one. So one, one more thing is we, we may not have time to uh, get everyone uh, on the uh, same, you know, same pace. So tomorrow we'll try our best to get you oriented with the Linux systems and, and you can practice before we uh, actually start that hands-on exercise uh, on Tuesday, uh, on Thursday, I think actually Wednesday, I think, because it's already Monday back there, right? So uh, we'll do that way. So again, uh, you don't need anything, just your laptop, uh, and we'll ask you to install some software tomorrow. Uh, come back tomorrow, join us, uh, and, and a lot of these talks you saw today, um, how do we align a lot of these different softwares we talked about. We may not have time to explore all of these, but we'll explore some basics of those ones. And again, thank you to all the speakers today and all the participants. Uh, thank you very much.